Let me do that. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting to order. The meeting has been noticed to Evans Print Media Group, WCOW Radio, Magnum Radio, La Crosse Tribune, Sparta City Hall, and Sparta Free Library. Please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to next state the Sparta Area School District mission statement to educate all students academically, emotionally, and socially to inspire curiosity and resilience. Are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, Mr. Russ, I think there's um, one of the policies, correct? Yes, I'd like to pull policy 6610 off the consent agenda, as that has to do with activity accounts, and we've received some guidance to hold off on activity accounts. Are there any changes or uh, changes to the agenda? If not, I would request a motion to adopt the agenda without article or policy 6610. So moved. First by Mr. Wells. Second. Second by Mr. Schulze. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next, we're going to go to the reorganization of officers. We will elect individuals to, we will elect individuals for board president, vice president, treasurer, and clerk, starting with the board president and working through the officers. Each elected officer will assume duties immediately upon being elected. After the officers are established, the board president will name committee chairs and members if applicable. The Wisconsin Association of School Boards states that there is no need for a second on a nomination or it will go to a roll call vote and board members may nominate themselves for a position. I will start by asking for nominations of the board president and I will ask for nominations three times. After the third time, we will do a roll call vote. Once the board president is elected, they will finish the election of the officers. Finally, the board president will name a chairperson as long as the person accepts the role for the committee of the whole and will ask for volunteers and an alternate to be the one WASB delegate for the annual state education convention in January and two, act as our CISA representative and alternate, which is a meeting on June 7th at this time. Do we have any questions before we begin the election process of our officers? At this time, I will call for nominations of board president. Do we have any nominations for board president? I'd like to nominate Anthony Schulze for board president. Mr. Schulze, will you accept that nomination? Yes, sir. Right. I have a nomination for Mr. Schulze. Do we have any nominations for board president? Do we have any nominations for board president? Hearing none, Ms. Markram, roll call vote. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Ms. Barron? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. I don't know why I was so nervous for that. Thank you, everybody. I, I appreciate the. You don't need to clap. No. <laughs> I appreciate that, Colin. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Russ, I thought you were going to take way longer than that. That was no, I'm just kidding. You did a great job. All right. <clears throat> Do we have any nominations for board vice president? I'll nominate Mr. Hendricks. Mr. Hendricks, would you accept that nomination? Yes. Thank you. 
Do I have any nominations for vice president? Do I have any nominations for vice president? Hearing none further, roll call. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Ms. Behrens? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you for that, Mr. Hendricks. Thank you. Do we have any nominations for board clerk? I'll nominate Mr. Burns Gilbert. Mr. Burns Gilbert, would you accept? I am going to decline that and make a nomination for Ms. Lopez. Ms. Lopez, would you accept that nomination? Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have any nominations for board clerk? Do we have any nominations for board clerk? Hearing no further, roll call. Mr. Wells? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Ms. Behrens? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Mrs. Lopez. Do we have any nominations for board treasurer? I would like to nominate Mr. McKenna for board treasurer. Mr. McKenna, would you accept that nomination? Yes. Thank you for that. Do we have any nominations for board treasurer? Do we have any nominations for board treasurer? Hearing no further, roll call. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Ms. Behrens? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you for that, Mr. McKenna. All right, at this time, um, I'm going to be naming the chairperson for the Committee of the Whole, and Mr. Burns Gilbert, I would ask that you accept that nomination. I can do that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. At this time, I would ask for a volunteer um, for the WASB delegate for the annual state convention. I'll be the delegate for the convention. Everybody on board with that? Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Wells. And then uh, I would ask for a volunteer as an alternate if Mr. Wells was not able to be there. I can be that alternate. Mr. Burns Gilbert, thank you so much for that. Wendy, how are we doing? All right, perfect. Um, I'll now ask for a volunteer and an alternate to be CISA representative. Is that you also, Mr. Wells? You did that last year? Okay. Well, would I have a volunteer for that this year? I will volunteer. Thank you for that, Mrs. Lopez. And uh, do I have a volunteer as an alternate? Thank you, Mr. Hendricks. All right, we are reorganized. Thank you everybody for that. I appreciate, appreciate everything there. All right, Mr. Russ, do we have any public input this evening? No, I do not believe we have any public input. There's a good crew here. This is they this wanted is to see my debut. Oh, oh man. Oh, oh is that what, what it is? is that laugh? What, that's what? great. <laughs> yeah, don't laugh quite so loud. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah. All right. Uh, with no public input, Colonel Messenger with the Fort McCoy report. And then Colonel Messenger, if you could just make sure that green light is on, we'll be good to go. <laughs> well, that can be. Yeah, you have two minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ready to go. Exactly. Uh, I, I do love watching democracy and work. So thank you for that. I have a number of boards at Fort McCoy, just like this, a bunch of different people with different opinions. And I just want to start by saying I appreciate your leadership by being on these boards. I know they're not easy. I know there's a lot of topics and I know there's a lot of decisions that have to be made by committee. And I really appreciate what you're doing for our youth, our kids and our community. Uh, most of you know me, I think, by now. I'm Colonel Steve Messenger. I've been here 10 months. When I showed up three months ago, I really didn't know what I was doing. Seven months later, I still don't know what I'm doing, uh, but I'm having just as much fun as I did before. Just like schools in Sparta, Port McCoy has good days and bad days, and uh, we just came off an optical course. We were running with a six-year-old, me and the first sergeant, so today was a really good day for us. 
I do want to say thank you to Sam Russ for being such a great partner in all this. You'll see him in our video in a second. We were in the radio together, which my wife said you crushed. And she's like, I wasn't speaking in the mic. So she gave me a bunch of plaque for that and uh, inviting me to the school multiple times. So Mr. Russ, thank you for being a wonderful partner for the 206 military kids that are sitting in the Sparta School District right now. Your district plays such an important role in supporting military youth. You do such a great job, and I would love it if you would take a look at the Fort McCoy video for month of the military child, which is from April. I assume you have like a video up there. So. All right, hit it. Okay, kids, we're going to read a story about the month of the military child. It all started when the adults went away. Where they all went, I just cannot say. We pulled up to the gate, and I said, oh, man, and the month of the military child began. Military kids can do anything, but should they and would they become the first string? They'd be ones who give the instruction. They'd even handle all the construction. They'd drive the equipment. They'd manage the load. They'd be the conductors on our railroad. We looked out the window right across the grass. Now the young kids were out pumping the gas. The theme of the month seemed very pleasant, honoring the past, treasuring the present. Shaping the future was the last part. We knew all these kids were state of the art. We walked towards the office and out came the last meeting. They barely had time to give us a greeting. Really busy, working hard, can't be bothered. Excuse me, gotta run, lots of work. I need coffee. Even the leadership each had a new name. I was beginning to think things would not be the same. We walked into our office and the staff looked brand new. It seems kids' influence certainly grew. Good morning, sir, she said with a smile. These military kids were going to be here a while. It seemed this young lady now has a career. Last week, she was Wisconsin Military Youth of the Year. I called Sergeant Major, surely you didn't leave, but no, kids were in charge, I now had to believe. We stepped into my office, this was such a scare, but it was not over, I looked at my chair, it spun around slowly, she looked very busy, I'm sorry, did you make an appointment with Izzy? These kids are our future, they are so resilient, it's the experiences they have that make them so brilliant. They'll be in charge very soon one day. Now let us hear what they have to say. The hardest part of being a military child is um, moving a lot. That we have to move away from friends and family. Probably because I've had to like move around to different places and restart, basically. The worst thing is that you have to move quite a lot. Your parents always miss your birthdays or special occasions that are very special to you. Probably the time away from your parents. My favorite part about being a military family is that we get to see new places and make new memories. I'm going to new places. Probably getting to like go new places and learning new things. Being a military family, it's kind of nice to get to know everybody else that's a military family. Probably being able to see new places that normal people wouldn't see. Like I used to live in Hawaii. That even when they are gone, you know that they're gone for a good reason. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities as a military kid, a lot of like camps you get to go to and all those things. Um, I think military kids are more resilient. Sparkle Area School District supports and sends thanks to all military children for their courage and sacrifices. At Toma Area School District, we're so proud of our military kids. Thank you for serving alongside your parents. The superintendents have all been so great. Their school's support is really first rate. Military kids are amazing, we said as we smiled. Come celebrate the month of a military child. Cut, that was a great job. I'll be in my editing room. So I, uh, I do want to thank just all the students that did that, uh, Sam Russ, the, the Toma team as well. And it is, we are blessed to live in a community that embraces the military spirit so well. So thank you for that. I do uh, want to talk about money real quick. So we released our economic impact statement just for last year, and it was $2.5 billion is what Fort McCoy brings into this community. It's about $650 million, and then it's a factor of four multiplication based on the 
the math problem. And there's impact aid funding. If you're not familiar with this, I just want to briefly cover it. So military schools that have a certain amount of military children get money from the government for that. Uh, if you have 400 students or over 3% of your population military kids, you are eligible. So out of 2,800 kids, 206 are military. That's about 8%. And you take advantage of this every year. So as per the math problem, in 2018 and 19, you received $79,000 of economic impact. In 2019, 2020, 85,000. And last year, 2021, 22, it was about half, $43,000. So some of that is based on just the number of forms that kids fill out that say, I'm a military child, they hand it in. So my recommendation is always, I hope you have some sort of spreadsheet tracker that has all the kids and did you fill out this form, yes or no? And that is direct money into the pockets of the Sparta School District. Moreover, there are grants available for DOD Education Agency. In 2017, you all received a $750,000 grant. You're all nodding your heads like you do this. And then you're in year, I think, two or three of the last grant from 721, another $750,000 for a STEM. So I encourage you to do that as well. But I am very fortunate to have you all as partners. Uh, it is, as the video says, it's tough being a military kid. I was not one. I grew up in one school and one household, K through 12. And now I watch my kids go through four high schools in four years. And it's tough. It's challenging. And we're very blessed to be part of a community that embraces our military kids. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for being a part of it. And we want to partner with you to make sure you're receiving the funding that you deserve for being such a great partner. And with that, I'll leave it open to questions. Any questions or comments for Colonel Messenger? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. Okay, thank you. Um, Wow, she did an amazing job reading that book, Dr. <laughs> Seuss style. That was phenomenal. Um, thank you for your service for, to your spouses, all spouses and all children for their service as well. It's amazing. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the Wisconsin Military Youth of the Year is an actual award. In the in the book, the young lady who was sitting at the desk and greeting you as you walked into your office, it said. Last week, she was the Wisconsin Military Youth of the Year. Yeah, so that was Isabella Hilt. She's an employee, of, or she's a kid of one of our employees who's also a reservist on the side, Bonnie Hilt, our, our resource management director. And she applied in this big program to be the Wisconsin, I'm sorry, the Military Youth of Fort McCoy. She won that competition, and then it goes to the state of Wisconsin. So she won the Wisconsin one, and now she's in regionals, which is the kind of the north northeast region she's competing for right now. Uh, but she's one of our youth that helps out with our kids in the daytime. She plays soccer over at Toma. She plays three sports. She's coaching. And she has so many volunteer hours with the kind of the younger kids at our Child and Youth Development Center. And then the older ones putting together programs. Just another future leader that you all are growing everywhere across the board. Congratulations to her and her family. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Any further questions or comments for Colonel Messenger? I just want to echo what Mrs. Lopez says. Thank you to you, to, to the soldiers, your spouses, all of your children, and, and thank you for choosing Sparta Area School District as well. So thank you, Colonel Messenger. Thanks, Anthony. I appreciate it. Next time I'll get here a little early and go shake your hand like last time. But uh, <laughs> it, was, perfect. it was great seeing you all again. Thank you. Hey, you can always wait until the end of the meeting. <laughs> I think uh, I'm, might, I'm uh, kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. All right. With that, uh, item 2B, FBLA report with Miss Byer. Ms. Byer and crew. All right. And then just make sure that microphone has the green light and you can adjust that microphone to match. Yep, I'm a little short. <laughs> no, okay. that's fine. Thank you. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Annabelle Hedrick. Um, and you want to introduce you guys? I'm Noelle Martinez. I'm Brian Santiago. Um, and we are a part of FBLA, which stands for Future Business Leaders of America. It's a leadership and service club, which is a student-led organization with over 250,000 members nationwide and internationally. The first chapter at Sparta High began in 1984, and we currently have 17 members. We have four seniors, two juniors, two sophomores, and nine freshmen. 
Um, one thing that's unique to FBLA at Sparta High School is that as business people, we are very good at raising money. So this means that our members typically don't have to pay for any dues, like for t-shirts or competitions, and we're able to pay for our meals and housing for state and national FBLA. One of the main big events at the beginning of the school year for FBLA, we are in charge of the food drive during homecoming, and we were able to approximately raise over 500 in canned goods and other uh, foods that we could donate to the pantries. We were a little bit sad this year that we weren't able to raise more than last year, but the pantry would, was happy to receive the donations. Another big service community event that we do was the winter weather wear share. It was big this year. We were able to raise a lot of winter clothing for students who are much younger, who go outside and enjoy playing in the snow. And we all know how kids, if they don't bring their snow pants or boots, they'll be stuck on a black blacktop. And, you know, that's not fun. <laughs> And a lot of the schools who we donated the winter clothing did collect and, you know, receive it in open arms. <clears throat> One of our fundraisers is the fall winter sports program, and we are able to earn annually two to three thousand dollars, depending on how many advertisements we procure and the students call the businesses to obtain the advertisements and help the invoicing. So uh, this is regional leadership competition and the top three advance to state. Um, as you can see, those are all of the people who participated in regionals. Um, you compete against 27 schools and there are workshops available. You can meet new people. Um, and the competitions involve graphic design, business law, intro to, intro to business financial math, business ethics, and journalism. Four of the seven qualified for state competition, but two seniors decided not to attend the state conference to compete. Uh, next up is the um, fundraising. So uh, my sister, her name is Liliana. She um, was diagnosed with leukemia about two months ago. And I was fortunate enough to um, have FBLA by my side. We did a penny war for FBLA week. Um, so all of the uh, proceeds went to my family for her. Um, and as you can see, we, we sorry, <laughs> we received $621.31. Um, there was also a Papa Murphy's fundraiser, which was also very successful, and I am very grateful for my FBLA family because um, it's been a little tough on my family, but these fundraisers were really successful for us. She's a little short. So uh, here's our princess ball, and here you can see all of the fun little pictures of our little princesses. Um, we have a record attendance this year with over 415 princesses, um, pre-K to sixth grade that attended this um, with escorts. There was a DJ for dancing, face painting, um, and I took photos and they were sold at $5. We also served cookies and hugs that were included in the $10. And all the princesses received flowers on their way out of the door. This event is a lot, um, upfront costs and coordination, but seeing the smiles and the excitement on the district princesses was really fun. And this was our biggest fundraiser of the year. And we had a record profits of this year around $5,000. We shared some of the face painting profits with the art club well, um, for the number of members that they had help for face painting, which would, takes a minimum of 12 face artists. Me. <laughs> Seniors competed um, in place for six. Start over. <laughs> this is for our state leadership competition at Green Bay and seniors competed. So I did um, and I placed six for business 
ethics and Vanessa Lee, who is not here, but she plays first in business law. So um, in order to do that, I had to write a one page paper for a scenario that they provided for me. I had to take a test. Um, and I also had in order to present my presentation to them, which was very nerve wracking because I'm not a very good public speaker. You guys not already heard me tripping over my words. Um, and it was also very nerve wracking for Vanessa because she had to study really hard and she dedicated her time to taking her test. Um, especially as a first year competitor, this was very fun and memories that I will take along with me forever in a day. Well, me and Annabelle uh, participated in the State Leadership Academy. We met a ton of people. We learned a lot of skills. We were able to talk to the CEO of FBLA. He was really inspiring with his speech. I was able to take a, learn a lot and take a lot of what he taught us in combating meeting new people, speaking in front of a group of people like you guys. You guys are amazing. Um, yeah, so uh, this was really fun and really informative. Um, I met a lot of new people and I really liked this leadership academy because usually I'm not very good at um, like teamwork and being able to like get along with a group of people and, you know, come up with new ideas and do new things, you know. So like in this academy, I was working a lot with new people, um, learning a lot of like leadership skills. And I learned a lot of unique and new things that I hadn't learned before. So this was a really cool thing to do. And I'm really glad I did it. So it is a little bit hard to qualify for nationals in our organization than some others because only top four get to go to state who qualified and are allowed to attend. Unfortunately, we do not have any qualifiers this year for Atlanta, but we are looking forward to next year in Orlando. FBLA is in every state um, in the US, Puerto Rico, US, Virginia, Islands, Europe, China, and hung Hungary. Um, in the past 10 years, students have attended nationals in and I <laughs> twice, Baltimore, Chicago, and Salt Lake City. So I think those are really great accomplishments. We would like to thank you all for being here and listening to us. We would appreciate it a lot if you guys would help us next year with our transportation fees. I know that a lot of clubs do not get any help, but hopefully, you guys could give us a hand with like a little extra cost that we face throughout our normal FBLA season. Do you guys have any, any other questions? Perfect. That's what I was waiting for. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from board members at this time? Go ahead, Mr. McKenna. I guess I have a couple comments. Um, you know, Brian, said that we're up here because we're awesome. That's not true. We're up here because you're awesome. It, I heard you guys talk about things that you're not good at, working as a team and public speaking. And I heard that from people who are working in a team and doing it while public speaking. You're doing a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Um, it's programs like this that helped us Sparta High School be successful and the Sparta High School being successful in turn makes you more successful. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you. And I think one really, really important thing to remember is you're standing up here talking to the Board of Education, but we're people just like you and you can be us, you can be leaders, you can, you know these things. And so don't be nervous. The public speaking was phenomenal. I thought you rocked it. It was great. 500 canned goods, 415 princesses, $5,000 fundraiser, 17 members. You have so much to be proud of and we just can't thank you enough. Is there anybody else up here that wanted to say something? Mr. Hendricks, go ahead. Sure. I, I have to say that um, I was in FBLA in the dark ages, so I have a soft spot in my heart for FBLA. Thank you, Mr. Hendricks. Any, any further comments or questions from board members? You keep rocking it.
thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you thank for you. your time. Thank, thank you. you for the transportation. I think he was welcome to do Hey, today. no problem at all. Yeah. Yep. Very much appreciated. All right. With that, we'll go to item 2C, Southwest Bus Service Report uh, from Mr. Jason Schwartz. And if you could just make sure green light, good to go. All set. Thank you. All righty. Uh, first, just want to thank you guys for uh, taking the time listening. Uh, just going to go over some quick facts um, and some uh, accomplishments for the year. So uh, transportation by the numbers. Uh, we have 46 pieces of equipment in Sparta. Uh, we run 40 AM PM routes, uh, 15 midday routes. Uh, that includes uh, special shuttles that we do. Um, sometimes students need some different transportation. So, so we do that as well. Um, currently scheduled for 385 trips. Um, we'll probably suppress 400 by the end of the year. I know we got a few more in today. So um, currently 22, 21 uh, number of students that we are have routing for. Um, and the number of miles we travel in a day is 34, 31. That puts our yearly total mileage at uh, 603,000 and change. Um, just for reference, that's uh, enough to go around the world five times and still have just enough to get to the moon and back. So um, quite, quite, quite a number of miles, um, quite a number of miles logged. So, um, lots of days that, you, that you'll see buses and, and they go a lot further than you think. So, um, one of our main focuses this year has been community involvement, um, uh, starts with sponsorships and participation. Um, always been a sponsor and participant of Butterfest. Um, we had the opportunity this year to be involved in Fall Fest as well. Um, we do sponsor uh, the Sparta Dance Team and the Robotics Team. Um, we do that through uh, volunteers uh, here in our office. Um, my daughter was a part of the Robotics Team. We have another employee who uh, her daughter is a part of the dance team. Um, so our employees donate their time to uh, help those clubs out too. So, um, and who doesn't love a good parade? Uh, that's probably one of our favorite things to do as a group. Um, we get together, we have a lot of fun Butterfest parade. Uh, the Christmas parade is probably my favorite. We can get a little more creative with stuff. Um, my favorite bus, the middle one, uh, when we did Santa Claus, but uh, this year we did National Lampoon. So, uh, that bus on the on the right side there is is decorated and that's a real tree on top. It's one tree and it's was huge. <laughs> so um yeah. So thanks, Derek. Uh local area events. Uh we're always uh happy to participate in any local area events. Uh we do touch a truck. Uh we did the career fair at the high school, um, Sparta's night out. Uh, we do Trick or Treat Street with Boys and Girls Club and uh, Stuff the Bus, uh, the Lions Club puts that on. So we're always happy to to do that. And again, all the people that participate in those things are all volunteers. No one gets paid to do that. Um, and we never have a, a problem getting people to show up to do that. So. Um, so those people who... Uh, volunteer for those things we will we like to show them some appreciation as well um last summer we did uh a loggers night so we took everybody from sparta we actually incorporated our other locations as well um took them to a loggers game um we do birthday breakfast in sparta so any employee who has a birthday in the month of april um we went out for breakfast um and just a little extra treat for them. Uh, we schedule one day for anybody who has that a birthday in that month and we take them out someplace local. Um, they get to pick and um, yeah, so we do that. Um, we try to utilize as, as local as possible for our Christmas party. Um, we're kind of outgrowing a, a, a lot of places, but uh, we do our best to try to keep everything as local as possible. And then uh, 
we have uh, sometimes we have uh, some employees that that fall on hard times for one reason or another. Um, and there's a group of of people that get together and we do um, charity garage sales and we're able to hold them right there at the shop. So rain or shine doesn't really matter. Um, and it, and all those proceeds get donated um, back to the needy family. Um, this year we had an opportunity um, to go to the state capitol for legislative day. Um, didn't really know what we were getting into, uh, but it was an opportunity to meet with um, legislators to go over some laws that are changing, some things that would like to be um, a little a little more bus driver friendly, um, make things a little easier for us to maintain and uh, and recruit new employees. So, um, yeah, it was a good experience. We got to meet with a lot of a lot of people and uh, got some good knowledge. Got to meet with other uh, other managers and uh, and uh, employees from around the state. So it was it was a good experience. And pretty much that's it. That's all I've got. So, do you anybody have any questions? Thanks so much oh. for that, Jason. Um, before yeah, we Mr. take Bus. some questions, I'd like to also introduce Mr. You oh. guys may not know Mr. Derek Boxrucker. He is the owner of Southwest. Um, so, Derek, would you like to say a few words at all? I know that Jason did a wonderful job, and you, <laughs> you know, no, Jason did a really good job. I, so, I but, can't take his thunder. I did a good job with the clicker. So, say, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Derek did a great job with the clicker. That yeah. was perfect. All right. Any questions or comments from board members at this time? Now, going back to that slide around the earth, I mean, there's some miles. So, yeah. <laughs> and again, you, you when, think... when we added them up, I couldn't, I was like, that can't be right. So yeah. I did it like three times. Yeah. That's what it comes out to. <laughs> but when you take a look at the cargo that we're hauling on those buses, yep. we just want to appreciate you for keeping all of our kids safe and our staff safe at, at all those times. So we really appreciate that. And we appreciate you guys. We have a, a great working relationship with everyone and, and the uh, staff at the school. So um it's been great so hopefully we can continue that going forward yeah mr mckenna go ahead yeah i think while derek is here it'd be remiss not to uh make sure you understand that fbla was actually asking you for free transportation oh. not us. <laughs> let us know well definitely i can respect that thank you all right jason and derek thank you so much for all your time and effort all right, with that, item 2A, Sparta Area School District Summer School Report, or uh, I'm sorry, our SASD School Counselor Report from all of our counselors. Everybody looks so serious. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm Katie Everson. I'm the school counselor at Southside Early Learning Center. I'm Hope Anderson, one of the school counselors at Herman Elementary. I'm Haley Lamprecht, another school counselor at Herman Elementary. And then you'll see in the picture, Andrea Ufile was not able to be here tonight. Hello, I'm Leslie Jacob, school counselor at Meadowview Middle School. I'm Melissa Frost, another counselor at Sparta Middle School. And I'm Carla O'Rourke, another counselor at Sparta Meadowview Middle School. Maria Cabinet, one of the school counselors at Sparta High School. And I'm Jess Tripp, I'm a counselor at the high school. And then Hillary Masika is another one of our team. She wasn't able to be here tonight. I'm, I'm just going to briefly go over what a uh, Wisconsin school counselor looks like and what that entails. We are required to have a master's degree. 99% um, of public schools in the state of Wisconsin employ school counselors. Um, a school counseling program usually entails a school counselor delivering a comprehensive program that serves all students. We do follow an ethic, ethics um, specifically designed for school counseling profession. 
School counselors have professional standards that are outlined the services that they provide to students. And the gen to generalize our role, we serve students K through 12 in the domains of academic, career, and social emotional support. The recommended ratio of a school counselor to student is 250 to one. So what exactly are we doing all day? I feel like the role of the counselor is a bit elusive. We wear many hats, we're constantly running. So we appreciate the time to come and share what our job looks like. So we do teach universal classroom lessons um, that looks a little bit different based on grade level. So at Herman, at the elementary level at least, we teach on a variety of topics, whether it's friendships, growth mindset, coping strategies, that's a very big one we touch on a lot throughout the year. And then also um, just need space. So if there's needs that arise, we support classrooms with those as well. We also work with small groups of students. Um, so students are identified as needing additional support using our school data, for example, assessments. Um, and then this data is collected in many different ways based on the unique needs of the school. And then from there, the groups are short-term and psychoeducational in nature. So usually about six to eight weeks. And again, a variety of topics, specifically at the elementary level, we do a lot with friendship groups, lunch bunches, um, coping skills, social skills, and getting the students together to form those peer relationships and continue those strong bonds. On another level, we do individual support and community referral. Um, so school counselors meet with students individually for short-term solution-focused counseling, specifically working on a lot of those different skills that I just talked about before. Students needing more intensive or longer-term counseling are referred to community organizations. So we have quite a few students who definitely have that need um, and support outside of school. While they're at school with us, we're there to support. But if they need that further intensive and long-term support outside of school, we make sure to refer them to whoever they may need. An important role of the school counselor is to work collaboratively with families and caregivers. And so whether we're helping a new student um, feel more comfortable and confident in their new school, or we're making sure that a student with a disability um, gets their needed accommodations, or we're ensuring that a student who's experiencing homelessness has access to the resources they need, uh, we work collaboratively um, with caregivers and families to ensure the student's success. And another um, important role of the school counselor is that we are an important member of the crisis response team, the threat assessment team, and also suicide risk assessments. So we um, support the most vulnerable students and we're also essential in keeping all students safe. As school counselors, we collaborate with teachers and our administration to work together as a team um, to support our students and be advocates on behalf of them. Um, uh, just a couple of things that we do um, to meet those needs is we have what's called a build, building consultation um, team. So if a teacher or staff member has a concern about a student, they can bring it to that team um, and we problem solve and come up with an action plan to help them be more successful. Um, and then we also um, work with the response to intervention and the positive behavior interventions and supports or PBIS to provide additional um, interventions for students um, so that they can be successful in the classroom. So in addition to all these other things that have been mentioned, we also work um, a lot with community organizations to um, establish partnerships to benefit our students. Um, we serve on committees, we help plan events, we help coordinate activities, all things to improve our climate at school for the students and involve the community uh, with that. So some of those examples would be our Child Abuse Prevention Tax Force, we are members of that. Um, we help to um, organize those activities and the blue ribbons around that you see um, uh, town. We also um, work with Brighter Tomorrows, which is um, um, domestic abuse organization in town. 
um, the Monroe County Safe Coalition. Um, we do work with the Challenge Academy. We bring um, a cadets in to the school to help tutor students a couple times a week um, and work individually to be positive role models for, um, for our students. We um, have mentorship um, partnerships with Fort McCoy. We do um, activities for our, our month of the military child and month of military family. And we try to support that and promote that as much as we can. So um, we do a lot of things in partnership with the community. PBIS is another. You've seen those um, um, those window clings around town. And we haven't worked on that for a while, but we go around and we you know, try to encourage community uh, members to work with us to um, help kids be respectful, responsible, and safe, not only in our school, but also in the community. Um, Christmas for Kids is another organization we work with. Um, whatever kids need, clothes, shoes, um, school supplies, food, we try to help in any way we can, so. All right, and so um, the last thing that we want to talk about is um, kind of the unique role that the high school counselor has. Um, up here I have the final step. So after our kids have been um, helped and and grown through all the, the K through eight experience in our district with all the support of everyone, um, it's our job to get them ready to be college career life ready. So we kind of have a few other things that we do um, that are unique. So we're constantly doing transfer pre transcript reviews, making sure that our students have all of their graduation requirements. It's an ongoing yearly um, uh, thing that we have to do, academic support and advising, um, just working with some of our struggling students. We meet with all of our juniors and their families every year to start talking about those next steps um, so they're on the right path I and mean, taking the right courses um, that support their goals for after high school. Then once again, then they get to their senior year, we meet again with all of the seniors um, just to check in again with those goals. Um, we're working on scheduling, schedule changes, um, college admissions and visits, campus visits. We have um, admissions coaches that come into our building from September all the way through December that are meeting with our students. Um, we have Star College Now, Early College Credit Program, which I know you've heard um, from us earlier this year, scholarships, financial aid. We're helping students fill out applications for college, for jobs, um, whatever that next step is for them, we're supporting. Um, and then we have the fun task of test coordinating, um, ACT, pre-ACT, PSAT, ASVAB, and AP. So lots of nice acronyms there. And so with us, we also do continuous check-ins with our students um, at the high school level. It's a little bit different. We do more of individual primary one-on-one -on -one counseling. We don't um, necessarily do groups. Um, we also do referrals um, as with the other levels. Um, we continue to do crisis evaluations and we are a part of the crisis response. Uh, we get the fortunate um, ability that we get exchange students. So this year we had four exchange students that we get to work with. So that's kind of a nice little perk of the high school that we get to do that. And then our students get to work on other opportunities like student leadership um, with like girls and boys Badger State. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions or comments from board members at this time? Um, I just had a, a quick question. So by a show of hands, how many of you were counselors through the, the pandemic? Okay. All right. So one one really important question I had is, as far as our community referrals go, have you seen an uptick or a downtick since COVID-19? I mean, where, where are we looking and, and how are you feeling from a counseling point of view? I definitely think all of us can say that we've seen a, a considerable increase. An increase. Okay. And so I... I that leads into my next question. I was hoping you weren't going to say it's perfect, but I, I think if there's a way that we can continue to work as a board, as administration with our counseling staff to try to help in any way, shape, or form with those possible, like with finding a way to help with decrease, decreasing that, um, I think that would be huge. So I, I think let's just make sure we keep the line of communications open so that, that we're doing and providing what you really need to, to provide those counseling services. Okay, 
but thank you so much for your time and effort. I, I can't even imagine being in your positions and, and dealing with some of the things you have to deal with and the amazing things you deal with too. But, but uh, thank you for everything you do. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, item 2A, uh, 2E, SASD Summer School Report. That's going to be Ms. Mansky and her team. Hi, I'm going to introduce Mr. Chambers. Tom Chambers is our DODEA grant coordinator, um, and he will talk to you about STEM camp. Good evening, everyone. First, I want to uh, thank the Sparta School District for. Sure. Yeah. Thanks to Sparta School District for uh, entrusting their DODEA grant with me. I appreciate that. Uh, um, that gesture and I really appreciate being back uh, in Sparta working uh, here with the kids uh, and the staff. Um, the One of the large pieces of the Dodea grant uh, for the last three years, has, or two prior years and this year, has been the STEM camp. And the STEM camp is uh, the creation of Goshen uh, Education Consultants, iBio, and Dodea. So uh, Goshen is an educational consulting company out of Illinois, and they work together with iBio, which is a curriculum uh, company out of Chicago that developed a girls STEM camp curriculum. Uh, and they've now taken that and applied it to the uh, uh, military connected students. And it's offered uh, around the country in 10 different school districts that are near military bases. So STEM camp with a K stands is an acronym, the whole thing. So STEM, you know, uh, and then the K uh, AMP is kids at, of active military personnel. Um, these are the 10 uh, STEM camps around the country. Um, there are four in the Midwest and I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, be in Derby, Kansas for a conference in March where I met uh, a bunch of the other um, directors uh, in my position and, and got a lot of really good information. We also met with the STEM camp uh, developers uh, and um, that helped me a lot uh, as I getting to know my position and things. Uh, so last year, the uh, STEM camp around the country, there were 10 of them, as I mentioned, 1400 uh, plus students, 45% uh, of the students were military connected. Um, I just checked before I came over here. We now, uh, as of today, have 122 students registered for this year's camp with a, uh, we have 125 seats. So I'm confident we're going to fill all those seats. Um, and 51% of those students are military connected uh, who are registered for this year in Sparta. Um, uh, the last number there, 82%, that's the number, the percentage of parents who felt that STEM camp was valuable essentially for their children. So it's uh, a very well-designed curriculum. It's a very uh, low tech, but high activity and very interactive for kids. Um, really a, a, a well well put together camp. Here are some more statistics from the uh, from the camp and a and a quote. Uh, and I had the privilege too of talking to some of our Sparta students who have attended camps in the past. We put together little videos at the end, um, and it was just fun talking to them even half a year later about how much excitement they had, how much fun they had with the camp. And um, so I'm very much looking forward to to June when. We get the kids here. So here are just some photos from the camp and the activities that the kids are doing. Um, this year's theme is Disaster Masters. So it's all about man-made and natural disasters. Um, and I, you'll see the, the different um, disaster uh, bullet points there uh, are the activities or the topics for each um, each day. And so students will rotate through those different topics uh, for the four days. And on Thursday of the camp, um, I'm hoping, I have a meeting tomorrow, 
um, with the REACT Center at, at Volk Field. And if you're not familiar with that, it's the Regional All Climate Training Center, which is an internationally recognized technical rescue and disaster response training center. And so they are the place where all military and civilian um personnel are trained for disasters in the state of Wisconsin. Every state has to have one of these training centers and ours is at uh, Volk Field. And they're really excited to uh, to be our field trip site. So we're hoping to be able to um, take the kids down there to see um, all of the different training that they do, uh, building collapse, uh, fire, um, all different kinds of um, training that they do there. And we're going to hopefully have a fun day with the kids down there. So I think next slide is that we're gonna do the video. All right, Chris, roll the video. So STEM camp is a five day summer program that takes place at 10 different military connected schools. The name STEM camp is right from the school. It's an acronym that stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for kids of active military personnel. So I think the most exciting thing for me as a teacher is just watching the kids be hands on and, and building and exploring and doing. You all don't know how to stop. Step camp, I do hands on activities that are really fun. The field trip was probably the best part. We got to touch surfing to learn about like the history of that farm. I learned that like with different curves on the aluminum, it makes different energy and makes it faster, which means more energy. So it was really all about problems. So here's a problem. What can you do to solve it? Not even got a solution, but can you make it better? Because we apply it to a new situation. So the kids are constantly trying to revisit, revamp, and improve and make things better, which I think really sets them up for success in, in their futures. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Any questions for me? Any questions for Mr. Chambers? Comments? He was one heck of a German teacher. I don't know. Yeah, I'm dating you totally, Mr. Chambers. But <laughs> yeah, you. yeah. Thank you so Dr. much. Sure. All right. <laughs> Camp Sparta. And then we have Dr. Wendy Burnett, who's here to talk about um, Camp Sparta. So summer school or Camp Sparta is coming up um, during the summer. We will start our regular summer school classes on July 10th this year. They're going to run for about four weeks. Um, I just put a couple of vague things on some slides, but I'll ask you for questions. So I'm an open book. Um, so we have four different types of classes. We have readiness classes for students entering grades pre-K through five to give them some of the academic skills that they need to be successful in the grade level they're entering um, in this coming year. We have enrichment classes, which have academic components, but they're more fun classes like uh, Bugs, Insects, and More, or The Wonderful World of Duct Tape, or um, Through the Eyes of Harry Potter, Crafting, Creating, and Challenging Hogwarts. Those are close to my heart. Um, <laughs> for grades 2 through 12, um, athletic classes, baseball, soccer, basketball, Spartan Fit, things like that. Um, we have middle, middle school credit recovery. Those are for students entering grades seven and eight who um, didn't earn credit in two or more of their core classes. They come and attend middle school credit recovery to gain the skills that they missed in those core classes. And then high school credit bearing courses are for students entering grades nine through 12 who either want to um, acquire credit before they would be able to take those classes like human geography, econ, things like that, or maybe they didn't earn the credit on their first try, so they are um, recovering the credit that they missed the first time. The locations, pre-K and kindergarten are at Southside. Um, Wynn is available for kindergarten at Southside. Holly is gonna talk to you a little bit uh, about that in a couple of minutes. 
our enrichment for grades one through eight and any athletics classes, unless otherwise noted in the catalog are at Herman. And then middle school and high school, middle school credit recovery and high school credit bearing courses are at the high school. Um, we do also offer um, a golf course uh, at the golf course. So we shuttle kids over there. And we do all our this year are also shuttling kids to the swimming pool for swimming lessons. So registration, um, many of you might not know that even though summer school runs from July 10th until August 1st, um, my part of summer school actually starts around December 1st and ends on September 30th um, because we send out the application for people who want to work summer school and that whole process goes on and creating the schedule and we're at the registration part right now. Um, we ask parents to pre-register their kids so we know where they're going to be and everything during the summer. Um, and then we open up Skyward for arena scheduling, meaning that parents can schedule their own kids for whatever classes they want. Um, this year, if students would like to take credit bearing high school courses, Ms. Smith, the student services secretary at the high school is actually entering them in Skyward. Um, toward the end of the school year, we do close arena scheduling. We take, keep taking registrations, but we enter them manually um, just to manage the number of kids in each class and make sure our staffing is right. Um, we do have quite a few families every year who come in on the first day of summer school to register for classes, which we know now to predict and leave enough open seats for those kids. Um, we do fill classes with the most room when they come in, but we kind of know which ones to leave at which grade levels. Um, and we do have a registration evening for our Spanish speaking families coming up where we offer support um, and help them navigate the system. We do also offer meals during the summer at Herman Elementary, Sparta High School, and Southside. Um, these are all open sites where people from the community, uh, ch any child age, um, I think birth through 18, can come and eat um, lunch. So that is available for our community as well. And then we have administration sharing responsibilities of the day-to-day -day supervision. And we have teachers and aides in both in the morning before classes start. And then um, at the end of the day, until they either are picked up by parents or until they go to win. Um, budget, teachers are paid $24 an hour. Aides and secretaries are paid their school year wage and all spending is done by either purchase order or P card, um, which the ones through June 30th have already gone into Leah's office for the spring. Busing, um, we're running the same stops as the previous year. We run group stops. We don't run door to door uh, busing during the summer. And we will run a shuttle between the high school, Herman Elementary, the golf course, and the pool. And we do not offer busing at the end of the day for win. We take, keep a track of attendance for um, enrichment and readiness courses because the DPI asks us to if they attended. That's how we get credit for the minutes. And Leah would love, I'm sure, to explain to you how summer school works into our um, what's the word for that? Yes. Um, I don't quite understand it. <laughs> um, and then students have to attend for a credit bearing course. Um, this is a little technical. They need 4,050 minutes of class time to, to offer credit. Uh, we allow students to miss one day. We do allow exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis, like we would in the school year if they have a significant health problem or something and can make up their work. Of course, we're going to um, allow an exception, but we do require their attendance if they want credit for the course, just like we do during the school year. Questions? Any questions or comments for Dr. Burnett? Thank you so much for that update. 
And next we'll have Christina June and she's gonna to talk to you about ESY. All right. Hi, I'm Christina June. I am a special education teacher at Southside Early Learning Center. Um, so extended school year um, is kind of like summer school, but it's kind of totally different as well. So um, sometimes we just have to tell parents it's summer school so they, they understand, but extended school year is a special education service. Um, it's based on an individual basis. So if a student receives special education services through the school year, they have an IEP, which is an individualized education plan. So the team members on that plan, which would be a special ed teacher, their classroom teacher, maybe if they have therapies, they decide in their yearly meeting if they qualify for extended school year. Um, so to qualify, the students have to show severe or substantial regression without that summer programming. Um, and then they have to show that it's difficult for that recoupment. So not everybody who has an IEP or has special ed services qualify. And once again, um, it's made by the team and it's done on an annual basis. So for example, I have a student last year that qualified, but this year they do not qualify. So ES, ESY services are not intended to accelerate learning. So I cannot teach anything new over the summer. I have to stick to what the kids are currently working on as their goals in their individual plans. Um, once again, it's intended to minimize um, the effects of regression and recruitment. Um, the other thing is we want to maintain those skills. We don't want those students to lose those skills over the summer. And it cannot be more than what they're receiving during the school year. So what's necessary to maintain, maintain current skills? So here's some cute little pictures of last year's ESY. Um, but for ESY, students can qualify for specially designed reading, math, or social emotional instruction. So for example, they could attend traditional summer school um, and the teacher would go and take them possibly for 15 minutes from the class they're in and work on whatever they need to in those areas. We current, or they could just come in for 15, 20 minutes to work on those areas. They do not have to be signed up for traditional summer school to receive ESY services. It's totally different. We currently this year do not have anybody um, signed up for those ESY services. Then we have our self-contained ABLE programming. ABLE stands for Ability-Based Learning Environment. Um, we have an ABLE program at every school in this district. I'd love to talk to you about that another time. Um, but it is for our students who take the alternate assessment. So when they get into third grade and above, they take that alternate assessment rather than the state standards because of their um, different ability levels. This is um, more of a self-contained program. It's for our students that do have more needs um, that could be met in those other areas. So for this year, we have 19 students signed up for that ABLE programming. Um, I will be at Southside and I have seven students, grade K through one. At Herman, Kirsten Tenner will have five students, grade two through five. And at the high school will be Heather Ellis and she has seven students, grade six through 12. Since I teach the littles, those little pictures on the bottom, um, we base our learning off of themes because that's something fun. So our themes this summer are pirates, bubbles, lemonade, and camping. So that'll be fun. Um, also, students can, the IEP team can decide if they qualify for a related service over the summer. So once again, they would have to meet those requirements. So for this summer, we have seven students receiving ESY services for speech and language eight students for occupational therapy, and four students for physical therapy. That's it. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much for that. Any questions or comments for Ms. June? Thank you so much for your update. And finally, we have Ms. Holly Church, and she is here to talk about when specifically in the summer. Thank you. Looking at this, we're going to have to be doing some thinking about our, our name when after school as we offer morning programming and summer programming, um, which is great that it's continuing to grow. This summer, we have two different sessions we're offering our full day program, which is brand new. It is fee-based and that will run June 
12th through July 7th, um, fee-based, uh, because it is full day. We'll be serving K through two, looking to serve 100 children, and we'll be open 7.30 to four. This is providing an option for families as the summer school shifted to the end of the summer, shortened up a bit, and students will be offered breakfast and lunch beginning June 19th. And then we'll also have WIN after Camp Sparta, which we've done for the last few years. This program is free for families and will serve students K through eight. Uh, kindergarten students will stay at Southside where they're doing their Camp Sparta learning. And one through eight is housed at Herman Elementary. And between the two sites, we're looking to serve about 200 kids. And those hours are noon until four. What can families expect when they sign up for summer win? We're providing children the opportunity to participate in a variety of activities, which benefit them socially, emotionally, and physically through activities that are safe, fun, and allow for positive experiences. And we're planning to achieve this through structured activities that we've been working on planning, um, getting out into the community, visiting parks, businesses, uh, and bringing in special guests to educate on a variety of topics. I know we've been talking to um, news channels coming in to talk about weather, going and visiting the school forest. Um, I think some of you came in and read last summer, so be looking for emails again. And that is what I have for summer programming. Thank you so much, Ms. Church. Any questions or comments for the WIN program? I have a quick question. Mr. Hendricks, uh, go ahead. Since we will be charging tuition or whatever you want to call it, will we qualify for summer school aid for the WIN program? Go ahead, Ms. Hauser. The program is fully funded out of Fund 80, so it does not qualify for summer school aid. Um, so our Fund 80 community service levy will be funding the win after Camp Sparta cost and subsidizing the remaining balance of the cost for the full day option. Thank you. Yep. Any other? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So for the full day win, you're looking to serve 100 students. I believe that registration already opened. Have you? Are you close to that 100 yet, or do we know how many you have? We have about 50 families that have said they're interested, and right around 20 that have come in and made their deposit so far. Okay. And how about for the after school or after Camp Sparta? Based on pre-registration, we had about the 200 um, say they're interested, and I have not gone into Skyward this week yet, but we were close to 80 last week that were scheduled in arena scheduling. Okay, wonderful. And then my last question regarding the full day win, it starts on June 12th. Yes. But the lunches and breakfast don't start until June 19th. So what are we going to do for kids' lunch, especially during that time? We've communicated to families and we'll reiterate um, sack lunches. Um, and if they have hardships, I think they can reach out and we'll go from there. Say sack lunches. The kids will bring their lunch for that first. Okay, very good. But if they need assistance, they can contact the secretary. Or... Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments from board members? All right. Well, thank you so much for that update. Thanks. All right. Item three, consent agenda. If all board members could please take a look at the consent agenda um, with the removal of policy 6610. Um, and, and after that, I would entertain a motion to approve. I'll move approval of the consent agenda. I have a motion from Mr. Hendricks to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second that. A second from Mr. Wells. Roll call. Oh, before we do the roll oh, call. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I think it would be appropriate just to call attention in employment recommendations to the um, resignations uh, that will take place over the summer and nutrition services. I mean, it's huge. Um, 
I think I noticed at least four um, employees who've been with us for many, many, many years. Um, and um, I'm sure there'll be recognition coming, but I don't think we should approve these without acknowledging the, the importance of those positions, those people. Yep, Ms. Tessing, um, head of nutrition services, along with uh, Amy Shanehofer, the administrative assistant to um, uh, nutrition services. Uh, Joan Hutchins is the lead at SHS, and uh, Mary Beth Kripe, I believe, is the fourth that you're referring to is also she's looking to maybe go part time. Um, but a lot of years of service and a lot of knowledge that we're working very hard to make sure we're going to ensure the smooth transition the best we can. But uh, we're very excited for um, those four specifically as they've worked very hard for our for our entire district, our community, our kids. But they've also worked very hard to say I'm done and good for them because I think we're all well, at least I can say that I'm working hard for that, too. Thank you for that, Mr. Hendricks. Is there any further discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, roll call. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. Barron? Ms. Barron? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Uh, now, policy 6610. Go ahead. Sorry, no, we just pulled it off the agenda Completely altogether. Pulled. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. All right, item 4A, discussion and possible action to approve health insurance for the 2023-2024 school year, Mr. Russ and Ms. Hauser. All right, I will take this one. So first, I would like to acknowledge the district's EBW committee, EBW standing for Employee Benefits and Wellness. The mission of this committee is to promote encourage and support a healthy lifestyle and work environment. The EBW committee uh, is composed of employees in our district from all of the employee classes. So we have administrators, middle management, certified and classified employees. And we also try to get a good representation from the multiple locations within our district. Many of these committee members have served on this committee for many years and are very active and involved and passionate about finding the best um, options for our staff that meet the needs of the most of our staff. And our committee also has um, regular attendance from Marsh McLennan Agency. So they partner with us, they are our insurance broker, but they also provide a lot of value added services through different programming ideas. They have a wellness coach who we've utilized um, and they help us to go out to the marketplace and to analyze our insurance benefit to make sure that it's meeting the needs of our district. So our committee meets year round with the following more of a focus on wellness and different programming that we can do throughout the year regarding wellness. And then uh, late winter, we switch gears to talking about our benefits because typically January or February timeframe, we start to get our benefit renewals for the upcoming plan year. So our benefit years run the same as our fiscal year, which is July 1 through June 30th. The goals of the EBW committee um, did not change this year. Last year, um, they've actually stayed pretty similar for many years now, but every couple of years we do an employee survey that helps to make sure that our goals are still accurate. Uh, we did one of those last year, and this year we thought that the goals would remain the same, which were to maintain steady premium rates, meaning the out-of-pocket cost per month per employee. We'd like to keep that as steady as possible that we would minimize increases to the deductible and out-of-pocket costs. So uh, keeping those from having drastic increases. Uh, we live in an area that has two large provider networks being Gunderson and Mayo. And we have employees who choose to go to both of those. Um, so being able to offer that dual choice so employees can pick which provider network they go to. We also have the local neighborhood family clinic that many of our employees enjoy going to and getting services there. And then finally, um, 
we don't feel it's advantageous for our employees to switch networks every year and they have to re-go through um, pre-existing conditions and redo their medications and things like that. It's a lot of work for the employee when we switch who our provider is. So a little bit of history this year, the 22-23 school year, we are uh, with a new health insurance provider, which is Group Health Trust or UMR. So we switched to them uh, about this time last year. And when we did that switch, we also made some plan design changes. Our deductible did increase at that time to 2,000 per single, 4,000 a family. 80% coinsurance, meaning after you meet the deductible, um, you still have some out-of-packet costs. The district does do a HRA contribution, which, which helps to offset that employee's deductible. And the district contributes 84.5% of the premiums. So when we got our renewal information uh, a couple months back now, it didn't look good. Um, we were quoted a 17.5% increase in premiums, meaning the cost we pay each month would go up 17.5%. And this was really due to uh, the fact that the insurance company, Group Health Trust, they paid out more this year than what they collected in, in premiums. So uh, they run a loss ratio of the amount of money they collected in each month versus what they paid out to clinics and providers. And that last ratio was 122%. Uh, what they like to see is kind of the break-even point, I guess, it would be more in the 80% range. So we were significantly higher. And so uh, having that information and knowing uh, what our goals were, we did ask Marsh McLennan, MMA, to go out to the marketplace and to obtain some quotes. Uh, so they did go back to Group Health Trust, which is our current provider, and we had them price out some different options, knowing that one of the most costly options we have in our plan is to have that dual choice. So without analyzing the dual choice, the deductibles would have over doubled for our families, which we thought uh, was too drastic. And so we had Group Health Trust price out Gunderson only options, Gunderson and Mayo options. We also went to Security Health, who is a Mayo only network. Uh, and we went to Quartz, who is a primarily Gunderson network, but does have a buy up option. After looking at those different options, we were able to get that 17.5% renewal uh, down to a 10% renewal. And this is the information that was brought to the workshop last week that was um, a joint workshop between the EBW committee and the Board of Education. And in that workshop, we compared the group health trust plan as well as the courts plan. We did not compare the security plan because it did not have that dual choice. There was no Gunderson option. So the group health trust plan and the courts plan were most similar. And after going through our goals and talking about the pros and cons, the recommendation that came out of that uh, workshop last week for your consideration tonight is to stay with group health trust, but to go to a dual option buy up plan. And so what that means is that employees would be able to pick from one of two offerings. They can pick a HMO only plan or they can pick a PPO plan. In the HMO plan, in essence, what it is, is it's a narrower network of hospitals uh, that I'll show you a graphic in just a minute here. Um, and as long as you're in that area of network providers, you have the full coverage. Um, but once you get out of that area, you wouldn't have any coverage. There's no out of network option. Gunderson is part of that network. Mayo is not part of that network. They also offered a PPO plan, which would include the HMO network and it would provide coverage at Mayo. The coverage at Mayo isn't as straightforward, um, but I'll get into that in a little bit. So here's an image of the Alliance network. 
uh, all the areas shaded in blue are where the network covers. You can see it covers the vast majority of Wisconsin. It covers up into the UP, down into Illinois. Um, and it covers many hospital systems. However, Mayo is not part of this network. So the HMO plan that makes up that 10% renewal, it'd have the same deductible for our employees as we have this year, the same co-pays and the same out-of-pocket max. So in, in essence, the summary of benefits would stay the same. Um, the local providers who are part of this network, again, there are many, but the local ones would be Gunderson, Toma, Black River and Vernon Memorials. So there are four hospital locations that are somewhat local um, and as part of the HMO plan. The PPO plan, if the employee chooses this plan and they stay within the Alliance network, they would also have the same benefits. Um, if they use, but they also have an option to go out of network which is considered mail. Uh, the out-of-network options are more costly than in-network, but they would have coverage. So if an employee wants that mail option, they would need to select the PPO plan. And through this plan, uh, there would be coverage at Mayo Rochester also. And so the slide is showing the cost. This is the monthly cost all in. This is not breaking out between employee and employer. So this is the cost for the quote. So you can see the cost for the HMO plan for a single and family. Um, and the PPO plan. Uh, again, as a reminder, currently the district pays 84.5% um, of, the, of the employee's insurance. What our proposal is, is that the district continue to pay 84.5%, but only of the HMO plan. Then um, the employee share would be the remaining 15.5% if they selected the HMO plan. However, if the employee selected the PPO plan, uh, in order for that proposal uh, to still be offered through Group Health Trust, the employee would need to buy up into that option, meaning the district would pay the 84.5% of the HMO plan, the employee would pay that remaining balance plus 100% of the buy up. Um, as far as budgetary impact, those uh, you should all have attached, but I can review those in discussion also if needed. Are there any questions? Any questions or comments from board members? Mr. Wells, go ahead. Yeah, I was a part of the, the committee that we had, and I, and I believe that there was some really good discussion on how we can move forward, not just today, but also all in the future, right? And I think that this that this option here that, that we've been presented is probably the best for not just today's sake, but also for future sake. So thank you, Mr. Wells. Any further comments or questions for Ms. Hauser or Mr. Russ at this time? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. Okay, thank you. So um I was also sitting in on that meeting with the EBW, the employee benefits and wellness committee. And I just want to say thank you to those staff members. They were incredibly engaged and had great questions and um, offered solutions and, and everything. Um, but I do have a question, Ms. Hauser, about the out of network. Did we get an answer back from um, Marsh and McClellan regarding if someone was on a vacation or an emergency care? Yes, we did. So under the HMO network, if you have a reason that you need to go to an emergency room, it would be fully covered even if, so there's the statistic in health insurance of people who went to the emergency room and people who went but didn't really need to go. You know, it wasn't an emergent situation. Either way, there would be 100% coverage if you're seen at an emergency room on the HMO plan. Thank you very much. Yep. 
Any further questions or comments from board members? Um, real quick, so it's not necessarily that you have to answer it right now, but when we take a look at at that 17.5% um, increase that was initially presented to us, uh, they're looking for around 80% uh, Sparta Area School District is at 122%. I'm just wondering if if that's if there's a bunch of small claims that are bringing it up to that 122, do we have a couple of really large claims? And if that's something that we need to, to focus on moving forward. Um, it's a multi-tiered. We do have several high cost claimants, but we can also be better with our consumerism. So when we have neighborhood family clinic as a free choice, how do we encourage employees to go there? Um, we also learned that the cost of receiving the same service at Gunderson versus Mayo is considerably more expensive just because of the discount rates um, are much greater at Gunderson than they are at Mayo. And so that's where this plan design came from is to provide a Mayo option to those who value that, um, but to those who are okay going to Gunderson, that's a more cost-effective option. So we're hoping and group health trust is hoping this too, that some of these plan design changes will help employees to change their consumerism behavior as well. So uh, additionally, we've talked, you know, administratively and as the EBW committee of how we continue to educate our employees to make those good consumer choices over the next year. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Yep. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Hauser or Mr. Russ? Hearing none, um, I would entertain a motion to approve the health insurance plan as presented for the 2023-2024 school year. Make that motion. I have a motion from Mr. Burns Gilbert. Do I have a second? I'll second. A second from Mr. McKenna. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. McKenna. Yes. Mr. Hendricks. Yes. Ms. Barron. Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, Mr. Russ, I think we have a couple of recusals. So at this time, we would ask that Mrs. Lopez and Ms. Barron's uh, recuse themselves from they're, the room. They're willingly to do it. They're voluntarily doing this. Yes. <laughs> Correct? I okay. willingly recuse Thank myself. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Thank you. And Ms. Markren's going to walk you out. And then when Ms. Markren comes back in, um, we'll start the discussion. Once we're done, we'll come out and uh, get you Ashley and Amy. Thank you. Item 4B, discussion and possible action to approve dental and vision insurance for the 2023-2024 school year. Mr. Russ and Ms. Hauser. This will hopefully be a quick one. Uh, we currently have both of our vision and dental coverages through Delta Dental. They did come back with a 0% increase, meaning the cost would stay the same as this year. And we have been very happy with them from both the uh, um, payroll and benefits onboarding standpoint, and also our employees have been happy with the use of the coverage and that. So we would recommend continuing with Delta Dental at the um, proposed flat rate. Any questions or comments for Ms. Hauser or Mr. Russ? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the dental and vision insurance plan as presented for the 2023-2024 school year. I'll make that motion. I have a motion from Mr. Hend Hendricks. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Second from Mr. Wells. Any further discussion on this? Roll call. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Motion carries 502 recused. If you could let them back in, that'd be great.
part of the recusal process is, is that the, the the person who volunteers recuses himself actually leaves the room, not just the stage area or anything like that. You were invited back, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Item 4C, discussion and possible action to approve 2023-2024 certified contracts. Mr. Russ. Uh, yes, in board docs, you have the list of certified staff that we would like to welcome back with open arms for the 23-24 school mm -hmm. year. Um, we're very proud of our staff. And um, if, if approved, these contracts will go out by May 15th and are due back by June 15th uh, per state statute. Thank you, Mr. Russ. Any questions or comments for Mr. Russ on this? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the 2023-2024 certified contracts as presented. I'll move that. I have a motion from Mr. Hendricks. Do I have a second? I will second that. A second from Mrs. Lopez. Any further discussion on this topic? Hearing none, roll call. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Ms. Barron? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Item 4D discussion and possible action to approve additional social and emotional support to students and or to approve market adjustments to the SASD co-curricular schedule. Mr. Russ. Uh, yes, just to recap, at our last board meeting, uh, the Board of Education asked administration to come back uh, with potential ideas for $150,000 in additional support for uh, social emotional learning and uh, come back with approximately $100,000 in possible market adjustment to the co-curricular scale uh, or schedule. So uh, we're going to take them both. Um, it's an and or. So we can go back and forth on the agenda. Um, ideas, we talked about it around the, uh, the cabinet agenda and some possible ideas for additional SEL support. Uh, as a reminder also, we do have a universal curriculum coming in that is not part of this $150,000 idea uh, that would be paid for universal curriculum for SEL um, K through 12 uh, would be part of a grant that will pay for it out of grants. So that is not included in this. We already have that. Uh, the two, the, some ideas that we want to bring forth for possible ideas, uh, social workers. Um, one of the things that we have found that social workers could be a good benefit. Uh, the city and the county, I'm sorry, the county is always looking for more social workers. Sorry about that. Um, you know, as with everything, trying to hire um, at this time is very difficult. But uh, we think we could possibly get two social workers for uh, about $150,000. Um, In-house counselor or therapist. Right now, we currently contract with some outside vendors, and they come in with some of their counselors and therapists to help our students. Uh, Ms. Friend, our uh, mental health navigator, helps assist that process as well. Um, but we do have several outside vendors that come in, meet with our kids and families uh, during school time on our property. Uh, that might be an idea to look for a full-time therapist for the district. Um, and we're thinking that would probably cost the entire $150,000. Um, SEL coaches, um, we're looking at this possibly being an extra duty contract. We have five buildings. Uh, with that implementation of the universal SEL curriculum, having someone in the building that really owns it, that really is that go-to person, if staff could go to besides administration, uh, that would be an idea. So those would be five extra duty contracts, for example, and that would be approximately $10,000. I'm just ballparking $2,000 for an extra duty contract, so that would be an option. The other option is, is that behavioral coaches. Uh, behavioral coaches work directly with the students and the teachers uh, to assist the students to make sure that they understand their expectation um, and to assist them getting back into the classroom. It could be a quick stop right now. Uh, if a student is asked to leave the classroom, they go to an office area where we do not have 
a, a certified teacher there to help them through it, to walk them through it, to make sure that they get well enough to return to the classroom um, as quick as possible. Uh, oftentimes they're in ALEC waiting for administration to come back and talk with them. That could take some time, um, but we're looking for possible. I, this is an idea, having behavioral coaches fill that void. Okay. So those are some ideas for SEL support. Costs for about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Two coaches, uh, two coaches would be about one hundred fifty thousand dollars because they would be considered certified staff. Okay. And then for market adjustments for co-curricular, um, in board docs in the in the public side, there's a summary of the recommendations that uh, after we went through, we meeting Miss Hauser, Miss Mickelson specifically went through very similar to the process that we did with classified and administration and middle management last year, and really looked where is Sparta fall within uh, our for the market with our local comparables. So after going through that process looking through several ideas, um, instead of the 100,000 approximately in market adjustments, we came back and recognized that about 45,000 would be, is what our recommendation would be if we're looking at market adjustments, which would make us comparable in uh, almost all the areas in regards to the top three uh, in our area. So for uh, a lot less than what the, uh, the board uh, asked us to look at. So, um, and that also affects, it's just not athletics. It is across the board. It's athletics, activities, and staff support when you look at the comparables uh, in regards to all of that. So with that information, open to any uh, questions that you may have um, for SEL or uh, co-curricular market adjustments. Questions or comments from board members uh, pertaining to SEL or the co-curricular wages? Mr. Hendricks, go ahead. Thank you. Um, going to the co-curricular wages, um, comparing the ranking, the current rank, ranking with the proposed ranking, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering how was it determined what the desired ranking should be? So, because in some cases, we went from ranking sixth and the proposing to go to third. In other cases, we were, I don't know, here's one, we were ranked fourth, but we're proposed to go to first. How was it determined what the ideal proposed ranking is for the wide yep. variety of positions? I will take that. Thank you. Um, so what I did is I pulled the data from the surrounding districts that we compare to Toma, Holman, Analaska, La Crosse, West Salem, and Bangor. And what you can see when looking at the data is trends that, for instance, your football head coach, your wrestling head coach, and your basketball head coach, they all typically make the same percent and they tended to be the same type of tiering. And so what I did first is I went through and grouped the positions that should stay in about the same percentage band based on what our neighbors are doing. And um, we did get the input of Mr. Blaha and Mr. Sanders as well. Um, and so uh, if we're using the example of a football coach, a wrestling coach, and a basketball coach, if we know that all three of them should be at the same percentage, um, on the fine arts side, it was, I believe, show choir and band tended to go together, for example. And we didn't want anybody to get a reduction in pay. So if, say, the target for that group of positions was 10%, one was already at 10% and one was at 5%, one might have jumped up. So I guess there was some strategy in making sure that we had some consistency between position types versus the goal of everybody being number three. So I don't, does that help, Mr. Hendricks? I'm sure there's great logic there. Just not, <laughs> there is. I'm just not following it. Um, well, if that answer works, I guarantee you there was logic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so maybe if I point out a, a specific, let's take basketball. Um, it, it, it was decided that 
it would be appropriate for the head varsity assistant one and two to be to be ranked highest paid in the conference, but not assistant level three. They they would they would go to the third. So so you know, not that it's a big deal, but so help me then with that specific. How how did was that determined? Yep. So the majority of districts um, in the sports that have three or four tiers, once you get to the second and third tier, they tend to pay the same amount, but there are a few districts who tier all the way down. And that's where we were. So for example, um, just picking some random numbers here, if the head coach made a thousand dollars, the assistant made 750, assistant two made 500 and so on. Um, that tiering differed between districts as far as if all assistants made the same or if each level made a little bit less. And so we went with the method that um, assistant twos and threes would make the same amount. And so therefore the dollar amount of change. So rather than applying say a straight 5% increase to everybody, um, we again grouped like positions together so that there were bands of, you know, all these positions should be at 8%, all these positions should be at 7%, for instance. And then, um, but the method we used may not be exactly the same as what each of those other six districts use. And so the ranking can fluctuate a little bit, but what it is, is it's consistent within our district based on the activities that we offer. And to piggyback off of that, uh, again, the thought process is right now, this is a market adjustment, right? This isn't a standard increase across the board. This is to bring certain levels to be equal to each other and, and where they they should be in the district based on administrative recommendations. So it's that's why you don't see it exactly the same across the board. It's getting it, it's adjusting the market so that we can be competitive from a co-curricular wage. And then we'll see standard increases. Um, that's the plan at least moving forward then. So um, Mr. Hendricks, did you have further questions? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, no, no, I don't have any other questions. I guess what my comment would be, um, if we can do all of this for $45,000, I, I certainly would, would support that. If it was a, a heck of a lot more money, I, I would question why we need to need to jump everyone up to one when they were in sixth place or so that kind of stuff. But um, heck, for $45,000, we'll, we'll be affecting a lot of positions and, and, and that's I, a good thing. And I would go a step further. I would actually, if we look at the bottom of the, the co-curricular comparison, there's a, a number of 47,460. Um, and so I guess that's, I'm not sure where we got the 45,000, but I, that would be my recommendation um, moving forward, if, you know, for approval is the $47,460. And I am very glad it's not 108,000. So thank you to the administration for, for finding a way to, to do that. Go ahead. And, and I'd like to thank Ms. Hauser and Ms. Mickelson for your, for getting all this information, because it's not easy. If everyone had the same co-curricular scale, it'd be easy. Um, so, but they did a lot of analysis and Ms. Hauser said it's, it's not as easy because if you could go your level one assistant may make less than your level two assistant in a, in a structure. So, um, it's not as easy as ours where level one makes this two and three, your level one could be your varsity assistant in some programs and some programs may say the varsity assistant is the least paid assistant. So it's really kind of hard, and I'd like to thank Ms. Hauser and Ms. Mickelson for taking the time to dive in, not just making everyone number one because that might not that wasn't the best way to go in our opinion. So, further questions on the co-curriculars? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. I saw you. Go thank ahead. you. Yes. Yeah. So um, I had Mr. Hendricks' question as well. So thank you for asking that. And I do understand that these are market wage adjustments, and I'm also very glad that it's not 108,000 that is being recommended, but um, I am kind of wondering if anyone has any background on where we, how we got to these particular wages for these particular sports. Um, is it due to the popularity of the sport or the number of hours that the coaches put into it or where that base wage comes from? Um, because there is quite a discrepancy between some of these different sports, um, and, which sports are for 
a little bit between which sports are for girls and which ones are for boys typically. Um, and then the middle school athletics, I noticed that they are all the same. And that's very interesting to me. So I was just wondering if anyone had any background. So there's a, we, we started with, uh, for the background about the percentages, that goes back to um, the negotiated agreement when we started to start setting, when we when I first got here 15 years ago, uh, we already had kind of a base pay. And that base pay, when we went from uh, pre-Act 10 to Act 10 times, we rolled that in. Okay. So that was kind of the background. Um, we have not looked at that holistically until, as far as I know now, to, and that's where that market adjustment comes in. Um, and then for uh, why the difference, uh, the middle school seasons are typically about the same length. So the girls basketball season and the boys basketball season, um, uh, football, you know, they all they all basically run about the same time length. So uh, that was would be my response to that. And then for the 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 high school activities, for the sports specifically, and that's very similar to the same realm. The winter sports get a little bit more, not just because they're more popular or anything like that. There's just time. There's just time. Um, so when you look at one of the things they looked at was the time factor. Um, they do time studies and hourly wages. I don't want to go into that, but um, but they are set by length of season. And uh, that's the best answer I can probably give you with that. Um, and now they're based on what we would expect. Okay, um, We don't want to say, hey, you know, this, this, and this. And then all of a sudden we shift in, you know, someone decides to leave or anything like that. So we really want to stay consistent with that, not just make a, a thing that, hey, this coach or this advisor is spending that much time. Yep, but it's due the length of season and what we feel is best based on our market adjustments. Okay, and so that's how it's determined um, for the high school fine arts. It's not necessarily the amount of time, but the length of the commitments. It's it's overall the length of the commitment probably drives more than what we had. And when we first started, you know, show choir and and that sort of thing, we were just I don't want to say throwing a dart out there, but we were just doing our best. And now when we look at that, that's why market adjustments were so good for us. I don't know if we did those market adjustments earlier when we first started those programs. Very good, thank you. Any further questions on the co-curricular conversation and then we can go back to SEL. Mr. Shosley, yes, I just please. wanted to add one more thing. So this 47,000 is based on our current base wage. So whatever we do for CPI on the teacher salary schedule, what you see is the actual dollar amounts. But really, when you look in the employee handbook, these are all percentages of base pay. So the 47000 is the market adjustment, and there would likely be an additional increase um, based on whatever is done with CPI. Through the negotiation process. So if a recommendation or a motion would be made, we would be looking at to prove the percentages that are presented, not the total dollar amount, because those dollars amount will change. Mr. Schultz, you have one, yeah, one go ahead. further question. Looking at the spreadsheet, am I, am I correct then when I look at this, through this process, are we adding new paid positions? No. No, we're not. So, for instance, three act play assistant, um, current wage is zero. So that's how it was described in our handbook currently, but we we do compensate. So it would be adding clarity to what we're already doing. Uh, same thing with robotics. We do have a robotics assistant currently. They fill out by timesheet. So um, there are no new positions created. It, uh, those are the two positions I can think of that are were not specified in the handbook and should have been. Okay. Thank you. Yep. In, in the handbook revisions, we're finding more 
you know, as we go through policies and we go through the board meetings, you'll be getting a, you know, an updated version of the handbook as well. And for some things that we'll be recommending changes with as well. Thank you, Mr. Russ. Mr. Brins Gilbert, go ahead. Yeah, I just was um, hoping for some clarification and just reading through some of these seemed like I was curious why it's lumped into the activities and co-curriculars. So the, the PBIS program, right? The PBIS, the teacher mentors, guiding coalition, assessment coordinators, unit leaders, and team leaders, those all seem like very different than advising a club and advising a sport, for example, seem more higher impact for our growth and development of the students. I'm just curious the logic behind putting that funding source together with the co-curriculars, if that makes sense. Um, our our uh, district has decided not to out, and Ms. Hauser, chime in if I'm wrong here. We don't have each department pay for their for their district support. So, for instance, guiding coalition, and uh, is under Miss um, uh, Mansky, for example. Miss Mansky doesn't have a, a budget for that under her line item for that. That's all comes out of the staffing. So, out of the staffing pool. These are all put together, and whether they're district-wide activities or site-based activities, we just wanted to separate them a little bit to to for this for this um, this purpose. But we don't have separate buckets for you get this much for student services, this much for instructional services, this much for activities, and and so forth. So it's all one big bucket. If that helps. Further questions or discussion on the co-curricular market adjustments? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the SASD co-curricular market adjustments in some or in total of $47,460. Uh, um, I'll go ahead, Mr. No, Russ. I, if, if, I'm not telling you how to make the motion, but we would, the best motion for, uh, we'd be recommending the percent and the market adjustments in the percents rather than a blanket amount because it's going to change so much. So I will make the motion to approve the percentages as presented. Ms. Margarin, is that clear enough? Okay. Do I have a second? <clears throat> I'll second. I have a second from Mr. McKenna. Any further discussion on this topic? I, I have one for Mr. Question. Hendricks, I'm go sorry. ahead. No, it's fine. Um, when All of these are based on, on the base wage. When we approve a new base wage, um, all of these will, will again go up by whatever percentage we apply to the base wage? Yes. To, well, to some stay, of most of them will. Most of them will. Go ahead, Mrs. Hauser. Some of them might not yeah. be attached to, might be a flat. So like a position that's 5% of base wage, if base wage goes up 2%, it would still be 5% of yep. base wage. So if base wage goes up $2,000, they'd get an additional 5% of that $2,000. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Mr. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Behrens? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, now on the SEL dis uh, discussion and conversation, any, any further discussion on this? Give me, yep. Mr. Wells, did I? Yeah, I was go just going to ask them to go back. So, uh, is there, because those are ideas, is there any specific administration or administrative recommendations that we have on this? It'd be, these are all great things. Uh, looking at the big picture, looking at us implementing our SEL curriculum for the first time, uh, it'd be my recommendation looking at the entire budget figure um, and such, it'd be our rec it'd be my recommendation that we look at those SEL coaches 
to really have someone at the building level at every building say this is what it's going to be this is a point person for every building for those sel uh curriculum supports um they be part of our pbis teams and you know and building teams but i think that would be an excellent first step to really help with the rollout of that sel curriculum because it's going to be anytime you roll out a curriculum it's going it's a big deal it's staff training it is modeling it is a lot of work with administration to make sure that all of our teachers are on the same page and um, some of the uh, lessons we're going to be asking our our teachers to talk about certain topics that you know what they may not be 100 percent comfortable with it's perfectly fine when you teach math you may not always you know what i'm more comfortable teaching linear algebra than i am parabolic geometry it just happens so we need to be able to, to to support those teachers through those discussions and an sel coach would help with those discussions so that would be our that would be my recommendation as a start um to get to to really help solidify that that good launch of the uh sel curriculum what did we say that the the potential budgetary impact on that was going to be i would say between 10 and fifteen thousand. i assumed about one coach per building maybe two at the secondary and the um you know at the bigger buildings so you're looking at you know probably about fifteen thousand dollars i would say roughly and um i know that behavioral problems have been an issue with within our not not just our district but also nationally too do you think this just the sel coaches would be a great first step to addressing those or do you think that there should be more action taken on that i think it's a good first step um with what we're trying to do in the classroom with our pbis with our uh, our school counselors are working very hard um, and with our, you know, change in administrative structure, um, I think it's a good first step to be able to do this, uh, especially given our current uh, budgetary environment. Further questions or discussion on this topic? Mrs. Lopez, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ress, behavior coaches, you mentioned students leaving the classroom and going to ALEC. Um, I understand that there are some situations where the classroom leaves and the student who is having the behavior issue remains with a behavior coach in place who would be able to address that situation immediately do you think that that would help prevent the i know that learning continues when the students are removed from the classroom because you have measures in place or at least you the uh, learning is it's attempted to continue would having a behavior coach um, available immediately help the rest of the students be able to stay in the classroom and have less loss of learning time? I don't know if it would. they would be able to, because when a situation's happening in a classroom, it's a judgment call immediately whether we need to, to clear the classroom or not, not necessarily wait for a behavior coach uh, or administrator, but it could come to that point. Uh, we could be looking at these relationships where it's not an administrator. Some some of our kids uh, see administrators as authority or authoritative, and they will you know sometimes shut down. So it would give them an opportunity for another trusting adult to really build those relationships, uh, to really focus in on their decision making and that sort of thing. So I think it will help the students, but in that specific uh, instant, I'm not sure if it would, if that would be the primary reason to do that, because we would still need another adult uh, in some way to do that. Um, but it would maybe say, hey, this, this, and that, and we move to another area, but I would say it wouldn't support that directly. Okay, thank you. Um, and social workers, if we were to employ a social worker, would that be a part-time contract with the district and a part-time contract with the county you said the county is always looking for social workers would we have a hard time filling that if we decided to go that route what's what are your thoughts there so the the county has uh, two things one they're run into a budget issue as well and two you know everyone's trying to fight for the same people so uh the way we talked that this would be our employee 
And um, it's my understanding, I could be wrong, but once you're a certif once you got your certification in social worker, you have the same authority as a county social worker. You could still work with the, the legal system and move forward that way. They would just be our employees. So we wouldn't have to be waiting for the, it, there's a long intake process in the county. This may speed that up. How many students would they be able to service? That would be the question that we would have uh, with the needs that we have. Is there a recommended ratio? I know there is for school psychologists and school counselors. Is I'm wondering for social workers, um, number of social workers to students. Doing a quick Google search, <laughs> one to 50. Oh, so we would need the number. If working with the, the, this is through the DPI, uh, students in intensive needs, a ratio of one to 50 is recommended. So we would be able to service, not saying we're always in the recommended amount, but even if you raise that up to 60 or 70, you're looking at about, you know, 140, 150 kids. Further questions or comments on this topic? Mr. McKenna, go ahead. Yeah, with the behavior coaches too, how, where would you put them? How, how would you would put them in two buildings that had the largest behavior issues? Would you share? What's the thoughts there? Haven't really dove into that all that much, but we would probably look at what our data says um, off the top of my head, uh, looking at our administrative structure, ne structure next year, probably look at Herman and Meadowview. Um, SHS does have that additional dean support. So I would say off the top of my head um, with in these coaches, if we, we go through what is designed, it's not picking up the phone necessarily and saying, hey, can you come to Montessori? No offense to Dr. Wendy, but she understands that that you just don't pick up the phone. So we'd have to work on those supports within that building. So um, the behavior coaches in that one for, uh, for Montessori would be resources. Doesn't mean that they can't go over to meet with them during their PLC time, during their staff meetings and give them uh, ideas and professional development, but really working with kids, uh, we'd probably look to our two largest um, elementary and middle school. So I'd say Herman and Meadowview off the top of my head. Any further? Yeah, go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. The potential budgetary impact for the behavior coaches would be $75,000 per position. They would be, we consider them, they would be a, a faculty member or a certified staff member. Further questions or comments on this topic? Go ahead, Mr. Hendricks. Yep. I'm sorry. I should know this. Where, where would the $150,000 come from? Do we have that in budgeted yet? We do not have that budgeted yet. Okay, so this is all theoretical. This is all theoretical. And if the board uh, decides to take you know, you know, put an additional $150,000 in, we would have to have those discussions about where that would be coming from or what would we take away? Do we wait for the state budget? Uh, we have budget stabilization. Um, and that's part of the reason why I think the SEL coaches, I'm, I'm, yeah, the SEL coaches would probably be the better way for me that I would recommend just knowing our entire state of our budget. Further questions or comments on this topic? Go ahead, Mr. Burns Gilbert. Yeah, I guess uh, I think that to me, it makes sense to have those building coaches. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially if it's 15,000 total, right? For that, for all five of them, if I heard Yeah, right. we'd probably maybe look to do two at SHS, two at, you know, but we're looking at if we stay with no more than 15,000, we can divvy that up the way we need to, to get the, the support to the, the staff. Yeah, but I, and I don't necessarily like the idea of approving a social worker or a behavior coach if we don't have a set plan of how that would be integrated, especially with the new SEL curriculum coming in, um, but would also want us to spend the next year figuring out how to do that with the data and how we learn through this new curriculum implementation for future, uh, whether that be one or two social workers or one or two behavior coaches or more, if that opens up doors down the road with budgets and things coming back from the state. Um, so that's, that's kind of where my head's at of the five SEL coaches with that lens of how can we build in either a social worker behavior coach in phase two and next steps down the road. We're going to be taking a lot of time, you know, very similar to when we talked about the employee benefit and wellness, really taking the time to dive into future needs and that sort of thing. Um, we'll do the same thing with SEL. We'll monitor how we're doing. We'll also know our budget. 
which is a big piece of this. Um, so, but that's knowing their budget and not knowing the state budget. There's a lot of question marks about adding and, and that sort of thing at this time. Any further discussion or comment on this topic? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. One final question. Um, I don't know how exactly how to say this, but sometimes when we make a decision up here, I worry how it impacts our teachers. I know that the idea is for the SEL coach to assist them with this new curriculum and, and all of that, but will, will that require more time, more paperwork, more effort on for our teachers, or will it truly be a, an assistance to them? a lot of the work with reviewing curriculums and and um, working with Ms. Moland to um, take the building's recommendations and figure out you know how we're going to move forward. So there's a lot of a lot of different topics and I shared some of those in the weekly notes I think last week it was um, so that I would see that um, SEL coach as the person who um, figures out the scope and sequence of the lessons that are being taught does does some of that, organization work that somebody needs to do in the building that somebody needs to own. Um, so, and having that person, like when we have new staff, how do we use this curriculum? Just, so just having that one really knowledgeable person that knows the ins and outs of that curriculum, because they're not, it's not going to be the same curriculum pre-K 12. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. So it would be that the most knowledgeable person in that building on that, that resource and how to help the teachers to use that resource effectively. So I do think it would be helpful for the teachers. Further discussion or questions? Hearing none, uh, based on the conversation we're having, the, I would entertain a motion to increase the SEL support by approving five extra duty coach positions. Mr. Rust, is that satisfied? I would say no more than $15,000 towards SEL support. Kind of like going off the motion that it was before, okay. um, and it be targeted at and be specifically earmarked for SEL coaches. Miss Margaret, good. So, how would you like? How would you prefer that? Be if I was making a motion, which is also all hypothetical, I would make a motion to approve an increase in the SEL. Um, I would make a motion to approve fifteen thousand dollars for additional SEL coaching support. I would also be open to that. So do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Thank you so much. Mr. I'll second that. I have a second from Mr. Burns Gilbert. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you for that. Any further discussion on social and emotional support to students? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. Final question, I promise. I just thought of it. Will the SEL coach be available for parent questions regarding curriculum? Absolutely. I don't, I wouldn't see why they wouldn't be available to do that. Oh, very good. Thank you. All right. Uh, hearing no more discussion, we'll move on to item 4E, discussion and possible action to approve grants and donations. Mr. Russ. Yes, we have two recommendations for your approval. Uh, the Sparta Soccer Club uh, for an amount of $10,000 to uh, towards the cost of the Memorial Field uh, scoreboard. And Matthew Construction donating uh, about thirteen thousand uh, dollars in steel to uh, our welding program and our metals program to strengthen that partnership. So uh, the Sparta Soccer Club and Matthew Construction for your approval, uh, if you would. Thank you so much to both of those. And at this time, I'd entertain a motion to approve the grants. I'll move approval. I have a motion from Mr. Hendricks. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Second from Mr. Wells. Any further discussion on this topic? Roll call. Mr. Wells? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Ms. Behrens? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Mr. Russ, please. Uh, we have a few more uh, very generous donations for your information. Uh, Delta Tampa Gamma for the backpack program, Faith Riders MM for the Chippewa Valley for the backpack program, PMP products for the high school robotics team fundraiser, uh, and Justin's uh, to Montessori due to their uh, student yearbooks. 
Thank you so much to those donors as well. Item 4F, announcements and information, Mr. Russ. All right, uh, just some upcoming information meetings. Uh, we have our policy workshop on 8450.01. Uh, that'll be Wednesday at five o'clock in Meadowviews LMC. Uh, we have our Youth, Human Growth and Development Advisory Committee getting together. Uh, that will be May 1st at five o'clock in the SHS cafeteria. Uh, and then we have our Committee of the Whole on May 8th, six o'clock right in here. And then uh, we're going to start our bo board goals and objective workshops to really start evaluating our board goals and objectives for the 23-24 school year, getting some ideas and moving that forward. That is going to be at 530 uh, in the Meadowview LMC. We move that to 530 on May 10th. We have our full board at the end of the month as well uh, here on the 22nd. Um, uh, soup with the soup review, we had... Um, Excellent turnout. We had about 50 people. We went through all the soup. We need to make more soup for our next one. The first one was we underestimated, we overestimated. This one we underestimated a little bit, but I don't think anyone left uh, being unhappy with the discussion or the soup uh, one way or another. But no, a lot of great questions. Uh, very good turnout from the community. Um, just great. We had students there. We had uh, parents. We had just regular community members there. Um, and just really a, a great time. We had good discussions about our future uh, facility, our facility, facility assessments. We talked about the auditorium, uh, making sure that we do have a goal for our auditorium to be make sure that we're ready to go uh, for the fall production of our musical. So it was really good. Um, lasted about an hour and a half, um, but it was just an excellent. I thought it was an excellent turnout, and I've already been asked when the next soup of the soup is. So uh, we might have something else during the summer months because I like soup all year, but some people might not like that. So we'll have to come up with a different idea. Um, uh, going into our facility uh, study, we're meeting again on Wednesday with uh, Bray and Market and Johnson to continue that discussion and really start moving forward. We have a survey for our faculty, which uh, we're promoting, promoting a lot. Uh, we'll start to have some listening sessions for our faculty and staff uh, in May, uh, so we'll let them know about that. Uh, auditorium. Uh, main stage is our auditorium uh, vendor who went through that assessment. They're working right with Bray uh, as well on that program. Um, Mr. Blaha and uh, Mr. Erickson are working with some various vendors in regards to what do we, what does our uh, sound system look like for rentals and that sort of thing. Uh, Ms. Hauser and I met with main stage Jeff today with Mr. Blaha, and um, we found out that the there is a much larger backlog now in the last few weeks of sound equipment. So it's looking even if the board said yes at that one upper, you know, uh, you know, at the April 10th meeting, uh, there is an excellent opportunity now that that would have been pushed back a month or two. So, um, so I wanted to share that with with the board because we were hoping that maybe we could get some of that equipment, put some as Ms. Hauser calls it, uh, some extension cords down, and let's, let's have a great show, but that's not uh, able to buy the equipment. However, we do have a very uh, person that works with Main Stage is in this sound business, and we're, have, we're setting up a time with him to see what we need to do to uh, make sure we get some equipment. So we do have opportunities and options, and uh, we are committed to making sure that that works. So uh, and before we go to news and happenings in SHS or SASD, uh, Ms. Lopez uh, went to uh, Cardinal Manufacturing in Oliva Strum and uh, as part of our facility, maybe looking at some increased CTE areas. Um, Cardinal Manufacturing is a student run organization where um, I don't want to take all of Ms. Lopez's thunder. So, Ms. Lopez, take it from there. Thank you so much. This was an absolutely incredible day at. Aliva Strom School District with Cardinal Manufacturing. So basically, 18 years ago, Craig Sigalski had a vision for a better, more relevant CTE program. What started as a plan in a dingy little shop, his words, with only one piece of working equipment has developed into a wildly successful, self-sustaining, student-run business. In their first year, they overspent their $15,000 school district budget by $11,000 for materials and netted a profit of $3,000. Today, they still have their $15,000 school district budget, but their production is $300,000 with a $50,000 material cost. 
Their basic philosophy is to make a plan and set it in action, create partnerships with local businesses while asking only how Cardinal Manufacturing can help them and not asking for support. In other words, they pay it forward. For their students, they make no assumptions as to their ability or previous experiences. They have incredibly high expectations and they also expect mistakes, but they consider those mistakes learning opportunities. Starting a student run business, according to Cardinal Manufacturing is a matter of faith, not religious faith, but trust that no matter where you are now, if you start small, think big and move fast, you'll get where you want to be. The students, in turn, get real-world employment experience as real employees. They're, they become district employees. They run a real business with real customers handling real money, meeting real deadlines, and overcoming real challenges. The day was incredibly exciting because I know that Sparta school, Area School District students and teachers are every bit as capable and committed as those at Cardinal Manufacturing. So I thank Sparta Area School District for hosting my visit, and I'd love to, in, to discuss this with anyone who is interested. Um, I would advocate for a similar program in our district, and I would help foster those partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez, for going up there and uh, bringing that back. Uh, we did have some, uh, Joanne Raddy's been up there in the past as well as our weld welding teacher and understands that value as well, as well. Um, and finally, uh, SASD news and happenings. Uh, we're coming up to the end of April, which means AP testing at SHS, and then a lot of field trips, activities, outdoor learning, and which involve no snow. Uh, for the rest of the uh, the school year, but uh, graduations are right around the corner. I'm sure a senior is counting down somewhere uh, in sales, High Point, and SHS. So a lot of great things going on. Um, I was walking through Meadowview today, and uh, the sixth grade group has a uh, field trip once a week for the next three or four weeks. So going to the planetarium in UWL, going to the school forest, uh, just a lot of great opportunities that they have. Thank you for that, Mr. Russ. Item 4G, discussion and possible action to move to closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, parent D, except as provided in Statute 304.06, parent 1, parent EG, and by rule promulgated under Statute 304.06, parent 1, parent EM. Considering specific applications of probation, extended supervision or parole or considering strategy for crime detection or prevention and 19.85 parent one parent C parent E parent F for the for the purpose of parent one discussion of initial proposal of base wage negotiations with the Sparta Education Association and parent two considering employment compensation of administrators classified staff and middle management legal had to have come up with that. At this time, I would entertain a motion. So moved. I have a motion from Mr. Burns Gilbert. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second from Mr. Hendricks. Roll call. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. Barron? Ms. Barron's? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. We are now in closed session.